Welcome to the GoTo Podcast. Each episode covers the brightest and boldest ideas from the world's leading experts in software development. Tune in for practical lessons, compelling theories, and plenty of inspiration. GoTo gathers the brightest minds in the software community to help developers tackle projects today, plan for tomorrow, and create a better future. Stay up to date with the latest in tech through GoTo's top-rated events held online and in person in cities like Amsterdam, London, Copenhagen, and Chicago, and by subscribing to the GoTo Conference's YouTube channel, where you can find thousands more high-quality dev talks. Learn more at gotopia.tech. Welcome to Go To Book Club. My name is Keisha Williams. I'm serving as your host today. I've been in tech for 26 years. I currently serve as a senior manager at Slalom in their AWS Cloud Residency Program. I'm also an AWS Machine Learning Hero and an Alexa Champion. I am so excited to be here today with Mike and John the authors of this amazing book, AWS Cookbook, Recipes for Success on AWS. I'd love to start with having the two of you introduce yourselves. Awesome. Thanks so much, Um, John Culkin. Right now, I'm a partner solutions architect at AWS. I've been in IT for almost 20 years, and I've always really been focused on using technology to solve problems. Prior to AWS, I was working at CloudReach with Mike as well. And we were lucky enough to really lead teams that were helping organizations navigate cloud migrations, optimizations, and modernizations. So that's part of where we got the experience to help us write this book. So I'm Mike Zazon. I am a senior cloud architect at AWS in the professional services unit. And we focus on helping customers modernize their businesses by refactoring and migrating applications and lots of infrastructure work as well. Awesome. I absolutely love this book because I design workloads on AWS on an almost daily basis. And this book has now become my go-to, no pun intended, (laughs) reference. (laughs) And the one thing that I absolutely love about this book is that it not only contains recipes for success, but it contains recipes with pictures and code. And I can say in real life, I hate like real cookbooks that give you the recipe, but they don't show you the picture of what the what the cake is supposed to look like. And so I really appreciated that about this book. Can you start by just telling us maybe Mike, why did you decide to write the book? So John and I, while we were working at CloudReach, we worked with a lot of customers really directly um, and those customers had development teams that we would sit with and they would ask us questions um, all the time when we're, you know, working with them in their office. And we, we saw common questions come up and uh, lots of patterns that, that development teams would take. And when we talked about writing this book, we thought, what if we could take those questions that we got so many times and just present them in a nice short format for people to be able to read through and consume. And these are all based off of our practical experience in helping people um, in AWS. So it came together uh, as part of the O'Reilly Cookbook series as a nice fit since they're kind of bite-sized. You can get through a recipe pretty quickly, but have a lot of value afterward. Anything you want to add there, John? I think Mike summarized a lot of it. It just really... When I think of the cloud, I get excited for all the capabilities that are now possible. And I love the format of the book where it's problem, solution, steps, because we have all this new capability that can lead to innovation, that can lead to agility, that can lead to global scale. But let's actually get down to the steps that are actually going to solve problems with it and make our world better. So I really like the format of the uh, the cookbook series that that O'Reilly had. So that's what kind of motivated me to do this. I would totally agree with that. I find that when I use this book, I have a specific problem that I'm trying to solve. I look at the table of contents, I do a quick scan, and I find the recipe that helps me solve that problem. And like you said, there are 
small sizes, I'm able to quickly read it and understand it and figure out what my next steps are. And I've actually gone through this book and picked out my favorite recipes. And we'll talk about some of those recipes today. So the first chapter in this book is dedicated to security. And I actually like that security is the first chapter because security is so important. I would say, John, did you intentionally pick security as the first chapter? And if so, why? You're right. Um, I think you're kind of getting the hint that we laid down. We made a, a conscious choice to choose security as the first chapter because it does spread across all these other recipes and all these other areas. And just because the cloud brings all these capabilities, we wanted to set a solid foundation of security with policies, with roles attached to principles and providing recipes such as 1.4, which will allow you to use a policy simulator to actually see what the intended effects of your policy would be before it goes into effect. So to really give you that confidence that what you're creating or cooking is going to be secure. So I would definitely agree with that, um, John. Security is really a part of everything. It just weaves itself into a lot of the other recipes in the book as well. So the first recipe that I'm going to talk about is connecting to EC2 instances using AWS Systems Manager Session Manager. Now, I personally have never used this to connect to EC2. I typically use SSH. So maybe, Mike, can you tell us, like, what are the benefits of using Session Manager instead of SSH? So there's several benefits to this, and this is one of my favorite features. Um, it's, it's one of the first things I teach people when I engage with them about how to use, because you essentially minimize any open ports on a machine from the network standpoint. And the benefits to that are reduced attack surface. You don't have to worry about port scanning and distribution of SSH keys or login credentials. So when you start a session, you ask the AWS control plane to give you a, um, uh, um, access in, and this access is logged and audited. It's con controlled through IAM. So you're asking for that. You get a, um, you, you can control granularly who can access what, but not having the SSH ports open, massive benefit. And also something that John and I do quite a bit in this book is have readers deploy, uh, isolated subnets with the AWS CDK to set up a foundation to expand on recipes. We use Session Manager quite a bit throughout the book. And when we do that, we deploy VPC endpoints inside of our VPCs so that we don't even have to have an internet gateway attached to our VPCs. And you can still access your machines and get a, a fast terminal within. And that's a pretty powerful thing. Um, sometimes you need an internet gateway to actually do something to serve something. But if you have a private workload, that's completely isolated. It's all inside your VPC. It's, it's, a, it's a very high security posture to take. So that's why we really like that service. Yeah, it definitely sounds awesome and more secure. I think I need to check that out. <laughs> I noticed in the book that there are hands-on challenges. I think that's really cool um, because you give recipes and then you give an opportunity to just try it out and, and be hands-on. So that's another great point of this book. The next recipe for security is encrypting EBS volumes using KMS keys. So just in general, encrypting data at rest in your AWS account is a common safety measure. measure. You can encrypt things in S3, DynamoDB, um, RDS, and more. So the question that I have for you, and maybe John, you can take this one. Talk to me about the strategy of layering KMS on top of other security strategies, and then just the variety of data encryption strategies offered by KMS. That's a great question and an observation too about how security needs to be layered. So if you think about um, maybe a web application where users are uploading files or some type of content to a web server, that network traffic needs to be encrypted. And that's one layer or one piece of security. But also when that data is received by the application and stored, 
on an EBS volume, you also want that to be encrypted. So we really felt that it was great to show customers all these capabilities that KMS gives them. And I was really um, happy to learn, uh, we definitely learned a lot writing this book, about some of the commands you can write to, you know, set default encryption keys for your EBS volumes very easily. So we were really happy to see that. And hopefully we did a good job of showing the readers about what's what's capable with AWS. Yeah, definitely. And something you mentioned about you all definitely learned a lot when writing this book. And I find that whenever I try to learn something, I really try to learn it as if I'm going to teach it to somebody because it just really helps helps things sink in and it just helps me grasp like all of the, the concepts. So I'm sure you all learned a lot. Absolutely. We learned a ton writing this book. And I think it was Einstein who said, if you can't explain something simply, then you don't really understand it. So we kind of took that mindset to really break down these complex at times cloud topics into hopefully a simple way for everybody to digest and consume. So, um, yeah, I think um, just having the chance to sit down and think about what recipes and what examples we want to um, convey really helped us even further our cloud knowledge. Definitely. And that's what I really loved about the book. Like everything is so simple and easy to follow and understand. So definitely a great job there. So now let's move over to chapter two which is all about networking. And in the book, you mentioned that networking like serves as the foundation and the backbone for all of the big services that you all cover in the book. And I would agree, like without reliable and secure connectivity, what can we really do? Not a lot. Now in this chapter, I picked uh, one recipe and that recipe is controlling network access to S3 from your VPC using VPC endpoints. And I know earlier we um, heard the concept of, of a VPC endpoint. On AWS, there are several VPC endpoint strategies. So there's the gateway endpoint and the interface endpoint. So my question is, well, both basically do the same thing, but what are the major differences between the two? Perfect. VPC endpoints are one of my favorite uh, co concepts and, and features within the VPC service. You can, you can so in, in terms of interface endpoint, you can have a network interface within your VPC and funnel access to AWS services through that um, network interface. And so what that means is, when you have a service inside of your VPC that needs to talk to another service like S3 or DynamoDB or, um, you know, Lambda potentially, you can, uh, either go out through an internet gateway and call a, uh, public AWS API, or you can install VPC endpoints within your VPC and hit them privately. This again, uh, allows you to not have an internet gateway attached to your VPCs if you don't need and have all access um, private, which is really, really nice. And the difference between the interface and gateway endpoints, gateway endpoints are at the route table level and interface endpoints end up being a network interface within your VPC. So they actually have a private IP address in your own address space that you hit. AWS handles some of the DNS magic, we'll just call it for now. To, um, to make that work from your application. But in the end, you take a private route over the AWS backbone to talk to the service through your VPC. So very, very powerful concept. It's very secure and just a wonderful way to um, have some flexibility and security with your network traffic in your VPC. Right, that's what, what I really like about it. It's just the security because we're not on the public internet. So if you all out there have questions and you wanna learn more, check out that recipe in the AWS cookbook. So now let's talk about chapter three, which is the storage chapter. There are several storage options on AWS. I would have to say that S3 is my favorite because I use it the most. 
And what I really love is a lot of the other services on AWS nicely integrate with S3. I picked actually two recipes from the storage chapter. And the first one is replicating S3 buckets to meet recovery point objectives. Most developers at some point will need to have some type of replication on S3 for their applications. In the book, you mention the same region replication and cross-region replication. Um, the, this recipe really discusses one-way replication, but there are several use cases for same region replication. And can you just tell us more about some of the popular use cases for that? I'm glad you uh, like storage so much that you picked two recipes from that chapter, so it really shows how much you like storage. And we love storage, too. I think that's a great... Or how much I don't like networking. <laughs> that could be it as well. But they're all great, right? And um, I think you had a good question about what could we do with um, replication of buckets. And there's a lot of great use cases. It could be for protecting against corruption of data when users... And we, and we love users, but sometimes they do the wrong thing. So they could upload a corrupt file or your application could have an error. So that could be a chance to really create a need to replicate the data to have something to, to recover from in case of corruption. Also, could be data sovereignty issues where you really want to protect your data and ensure that it's replicated to another region that you define in AWS. We've just seen a lot of great usage. And I think it's one of the great things about the book where we know there's going to be more use cases out there that we didn't think about. And we wanted to give readers these tools to create these outcomes, which really helpful solve their problems for their organizations. Yeah, I totally agree that. Like I mentioned, this book has really become my go-to guide because I'm building on AWS every day. So it's definitely starting to serve that purpose for me. The next recipe I have is observing S3 storage and access metrics using storage lens. I was excited when I was reading this recipe about storage lens because it's a service that I haven't had an opportunity to explore yet. So just at a high level, can you tell everyone out there what is storage lens and talk to me about the free versus advanced metrics available. So I can take that one. Yes. Um, Storage Lens provides an observability layer on top of S3 that so many people have wanted for a long time. And like you, I'm, I'm, I'm glad this is here. You get a great insight into the metrics of how much you're actually storing in S3. Because if you think about it, in the past, when you had just been putting objects on S3, really the only way people would really have that observability is to look at their bill later or make a bunch of queries um, to some APIs. And with, with Storage Lens, you actually get observability that is actionable. You can see things like the tiers of storage you're using. So if you're in S3 standard or infrequently accessed, or maybe you've got things in uh, archive. Um, you've got uh, you know space usage, which is really really nice. And these metrics can be rolled up. Um, and something we talk about later in the book is uh, AWS organizations in our chapter nine, which we might get to today. But being able to see all of your S3 usage across your org or just at your account level is really really nice. It helps you have just better control over uh, what you're using S3 for, whether it's for application usage or maybe you have data lake usage. It's just a really nice layer there. And as far as the free metrics and advanced metrics, the free metrics give you enough to make some just decisions on how to manage your own data. But the advanced metrics give you so much more capability in terms of maybe scheduling some lifecycle to different types of storage. And really at the end, maybe driving some cost savings for yourself and your own usage. Definitely. I I really believe that anyone out there using S3 will find these metrics through Storage Lens uh, very helpful. So definitely check it out. Now we're going to move to Chapter 4, and Chapter 4 is all about databases. There are a ton of database services on AWS. We have relational databases, graph databases, NoSQL databases, 
document databases, in-memory data stores, and the list goes on. There's a lot of flexibility when it comes to databases. Um, there are even managed services that will help you manage your, your databases. So the first recipe that I have is migrating databases to Amazon RDS using DMS. And this recipe really caught my eye because right now I'm in the middle of a project uh, migrating an on-prem DB2 database to Amazon RDS Postgres. And so when I saw this res recipe, I just had to <laughs> read it. And in the, in the recipe, it talks about using DMS. So John, can you talk to us about how the mappings work in DMS using that schema conversion tool? Absolutely, and uh, excited to hear that you're working with DB2. That's gotta be a, a great experience. <laughs> I know. <laughs> the DMS tool is very powerful because you hear about the cloud, you get excited about the capabilities, but how do you move there? So having a tool like DMS and the schema conversion tool really enables you to accelerate your usage of the cloud and hopefully turn this data into information which solves problems. And, and as you mentioned, the databases in AWS are really purpose-built you know, for solving problems in the most efficient and effective way. I love the DMS and schema conversion tool because it makes it easier for developers to not have to be a DBA with years of expertise to be able to change a database and then convert it to a format which is uh, we'll call more cloud friendly to then take advantage of all this availability, security, reliability, um, sustainability features that the cloud has available. So it was really exciting for us to just hopefully give these readers the capability now to go out and uh, to make these things happen with these tools. Right, definitely. DMS, as my claim to fame, is really be, being a Java developer, definitely not a DBA. And the, the, D, the DMS service in that schema conversion tool, really, like you mentioned it, I don't have to be a DBA in order to do that piece of the work. And so it's, it's really been helpful on the project that I'm on now. Now we're going to move on to chapter five, and that's dedicated to serverless. And I remember when I first heard the term serverless many years ago, I was like, server what? Like that's not, not even possible. I think serverless has been one of the more popular buzzwords in the IT industry. All that to say there are a ton of serverless services on AWS. Uh, the first recipe is configuring an application load balancer to invoke a Lambda function. Now, the load balancer is very flexible in that it can have many different targets, like Lambda functions, containers, EC2 instances. And I mentioned before that, that the book has hands-on challenges, which I think is really cool. And one challenge associated with this recipe recommended putting an Amazon API gateway in front of the Lambda function. And so my question for you, Mike, is what additional capabilities do you get by going through API Gateway instead of directly to the Lambda from the load balancer? That's a great question. And the, the, the most frequent uh, pattern that we see um, people use when they're developing potentially microservices and APIs using Lambda functions is using a Lambda um, with API Gateway. And so some of the great features of API Gateway being, you know, being able to have um, promotion within environments. So you can have your all of your environments and your API um, laid out and then promote that up through and then have lots of control over the HTTP methods that you accept for those um, functions and handing them downstream. API Gateway also has some great integration with the network load balancer. So if you had to hand off to a compute service, maybe something running on EC2, you could have API Gateway use a uh, private connection into a network load balancer and have your EC2 instance respond back. So maybe a portion of your API is running 
on your legacy server, but you're slowly migrating your um, application into microservices and able to break those into lambdas. And so during your migration, you could have half running on EC2 and half running in your lambda and then take your time in moving your entire API over to serverless in a, in a microservices way. But tons of great capabilities there. Um, and it's a really nice pattern. And so offering it as a challenge um, is, is something we thought would be really interesting. A really simple use case with the application load balancer is, 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 is one thing, but, but once you take that, take and accept that challenge, you'll see so many capabilities later with the uh, API gateway. Yeah, I definitely agree that when I think about past projects that I've been on, we definitely use that pattern to put API gateway in front of a Lambda function. So that's great that that pattern is in this book to help people learn it. Let's take one more recipe from the serverless chapter. And this one is packaging Lambda code in a container image. And I think it's so cool that serverless code can be packaged in containers. And I know this feature is fairly new. So my question is, um, maybe John, you can tell us why this functionality was added and the different runtimes that are supported. Awesome. I'm glad you picked two serverless recipes as well. I was worried that I wouldn't get a chance to talk about serverless because I think it's awesome that it really empowers developers. And we, when you hear about the cloud and AWS, it's really about removing the, the undifferentiated heavy lifting is, is the buzz phrase, if you will, to really allow developers who know how to write Python, who might be familiar with a, a Docker file in this case. So let's not make them learn something new. Let's meet them where they are and provide them these new mechanisms to get their code into the cloud, have it be executed, and then provide you know, great results for the users of their applications. I thought this was a, a great example of how AWS really listens to customers and hears about what they wanted to do with their code. And they might have existing workflows that utilize Docker files. So rather than having to convert Docker files into another format, this is a great way to take your existing workflow, your existing Docker files, and then hand it off to Lambda to have that code be executed um, in, a, in a serverless fashion, which is awesome. I would agree. That is awesome. I know. When that was announced, everyone was super excited and happy about it. And I think that's a great lead in to chapter six, which is dedicated to containers. And I've been in tech for 26 years, and I remember the world before containers. I also remember the world before CICD, and it, it wasn't a fun place to be. <laughs> What I love about containers is that it just ensures consistency whenever you deploy your application to different environments. That is the, the big win. And when I look at running containers on AWS, there are several options. There's straight EC2, ECS, EKS, EKS plus Fargate. ECS anywhere, EKS anywhere. And so I love the flexibility. The first recipe that I called out, which is super important, it's scanning images for security vulnerabilities on push to Amazon ECR, which is the container registry. Can you talk to us about the common vulnerabilities and exposures database, what that is and how it integrates with, with ECR? Yeah, definitely. I can answer that. The uh, And this feature gets me really excited because it provides actionable, um, very, very critical uh, feedback about the security posture of your application. So um, in many cases, in a Docker file, you'll be installing some packages and dependencies, things like um, maybe the Apache web server or um, maybe some Python uh, libraries. And when you do that, you're installing a specific version in most cases. And these being open source uh, packages, many times they're improved. Uh, security vulnerabilities are found and patched, but they're also reported to um, reported and aggregated in a vulnerability database. And they're assigned a risk score uh, so that you can, um, you know, really understand the, the risk level of that specific vulnerability that was found. 
So if there was some sort of remote code execution vulnerability, it's probably going to be something closer to a 10. And if there's something like, uh, you, you know, maybe some local, um, like file write capability that was only to like temporary space and that was it, maybe that's a little bit less, maybe like a five. So, um, of course, all security vulnerabilities we should take seriously, but the ones that are tens, um, are definitely very, very actionable immediately, um, for, for every organization. And so with ECR scan on push, you can actually get feedback about these scores when you push your container image. And then with those results, you can decide whether or not to fix uh, before you deploy and run your application to something like ECS or, or EKS. Um, and you mentioned CI CD as part of a build process, a build push process. You could actually potentially fail a build if you found vulnerabilities higher than a certain score so that you knew right away, your developers knew right away not to take that image any further. Let's fix those vulnerabilities and then push and get the build to pass. So it brings in a lot of great CI CD possibilities there too. Right. That sounds like an awesome feature that really everyone should take advantage of. I really like the tie back to failing a build if it has high like security vulnerabilities. Very useful feature. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to move on to chapter seven, which is dedicated to big data. I think the book mentions that data is the new gold. Um, data is definitely the new gold. Um, I think there's more data than gold, though. <laughs> and what really excites me about big data, I'm a huge fan of machine learning and how it allows you to find new insights in your data. So because I love machine learning, I love data. But before we go to machine learning, let's focus on data. And I found in the book several useful recipes. Today, we're going to talk about automatically discovering metadata with AWS glue crawlers. Now, I remember in the past having CSV files that I needed to parse and find metadata um, from, and I would have to write a script maybe in Python or in, in Java. But because of a service called AWS Glue, I no longer need to do that, which is super exciting. So my question for you, John, is how easy is it to configure a Glue crawler to scan source data? And can you also talk to us about the debugging process? Awesome question. And I like how you tied it to machine learning, which is such an exciting topic as well. But you need to have data, clean data, organized data, and able to train those awesome AI ML models. So a tool like Glue will really help you get a point and click interface right out of the box, very easy to use when you present it with mountains of data, be it structured, semi-structured, unstructured. And, and you have to make sense of it and kind of wrangle it in, if you will, and put your arms around it and in, enforce those rules and gather those initial insights. Similar to um, what you're talking about with the CSV files, there's data inside those columns, but also there's metadata surrounding that. When was the last time it was modified? Who modified it? When was it uploaded? So those type of tidbits really help you make better decisions down the road when you're analyzing and trying to gather insights from that data. Yes, definitely a useful service, as are most of the services on AWS, I must admit. <laughs> so let's jump straight to chapter eight, which is my favorite chapter, AI and ML. I mentioned earlier that I am a machine learning hero. So I believe this was my favorite chapter. I found so many of the recipes to be useful. It was very hard for me to pick one or two for us to talk about today. So the first one that we're going to talk about is transcribing a podcast. There are a lot of us out here with podcasts and I I've appeared on many of AWS uh, related podcasts. Like what if you need to create this text transcript from your podcast? Of course, there's a service on AWS that will help you do that. 
So Mike, my question is, can you talk to us about the process to create a transcript from an MP3 based audio file? And then which languages are supported? We present this recipe in terms of um, trying to show the ease of use of the AI services on AWS. Um, we were really excited that it, it, it is so easy for a developer or just a, just a user on their command line to, to, to issue one AWS CLI command and get a response back with text from an audio file. It's a fantastic service. So if you think about a, maybe a, a podcasting platform building this into their service, as soon as their podcasters would upload, um, uh, their, their, their MP3 based podcasts, the service could automatically generate transcriptions, which could then let all kinds of great stuff happen. It, you could have, um, you know, different types of, um, users from an accessibility standpoint be able to consume your, your, your media. Um, you could then run searches on top and pick out. You could summarize, um, portions and then, you know, bring those on top. It's it's really uh, amazing what you could what you could do with that. But that first step in that one line command we give you to actually initiate that transcription was was such a powerful command that's leveraging so much training behind the scenes on um, transcription. And as far as the number of languages supported, I had to look at the official documentation. I don't know off the top of my head, but that's a that's a great question. Yeah, so definitely check out that service. Like literally at the click of a button, you can take that audio file and have that text transcript that you can then upload on your website. So super cool. The next recipe from the AI and machine learning chapter is redacting PII from text using Comprehend. So many projects that I've worked on have like PII data, so passport numbers, so security numbers. And it's always a huge concern because that's information that we have to keep safe. So my question for you, John, is let's say you have data stored in S3. How does Comprehend help with detecting PII and how is that different from what Macy provides? That's, that's a great question. One of the benefits I think of using Comprehend to detect PII, to not only detect but also redact PII, is to place it in a workflow. So an example that we talk about is if you have maybe a workforce who needs to look over documents and the documents may have things like passport numbers, as you mentioned. Comprehend can not only detect which documents have this sensitive information, but also then redact those fields so that the, work, the data can still be processed downstream. So it's a really great way to add security to your workflow by removing those fields, but also by detecting those fields, because you may want to handle a document differently if you know that it has PII in it. Yes, that's definitely a useful service. And like I mentioned, almost all projects that I've worked on have some level of PII information that needs to be protected. I really enjoyed the AI and machine learning uh, recipes in this book. Now let's go to the next chapter, which is related to account management. I picked one uh, recipe and it's modifying tags for many resources at one time with the tag editor. And what I've seen on some of my past projects, when we were just getting started with the cloud, tagging wasn't something that we really considered. But as we matured, we needed to go back and tag resources that were already in production. And so my question for you, Mike, is how easy is it to modify tags once resources have been created? And are there any resources that can't be tagged after you create them? I totally agree with you. The tagging, the, the importance of tagging is so um, massive, it, it, especially if like you have had to go, on, go back and re-tag things and amend tags or change tags. And you know, many times we see people that have a little more cloud maturity. They might be 
automatically tagging things through other mechanisms like maybe they're using CloudFormation or maybe Terraform or something like CDK that the tags are automatically applied to the resources that they're creating. Um, but if you're deploying things one by one, or if you're maybe a new user or um, manually building things, you, you might not be um, able to take advantage of that automation. So Tag Editor lets you edit tags at, at scale um, for many resources. So if you just wanted to apply, maybe you've got an account that has all of your stuff in it, and you just want to be able to apply a tag on everything that says it's yours because you're about to invite somebody else to start using your own account, right? So you can start to tell the difference between which is whose, whose resources are what. This is a great way to do it. So you can select everything in your account that's taggable and apply your own tag. Maybe it's a name tag or some sort of billing tag. If you're going to split billing with somebody, but you can, you can do that in a, in a batch sense with tag editor and um, maybe even edit that tag later if you need to. So it lets you search and, and, and query and batch edit tags at scale. I think that's a very useful feature. And based on timing, it looks like we have time for one more recipe from this chapter. The next recipe that I'd like to talk about is enabling CloudTrail logging for your AWS account. And this feature is very important. I just relate everything back to like my past experiences. And I remember when there was a security incident and we were trying to track down like what was the flow that led up to this incident. And we went to CloudTrail and the default logging provided wasn't enough. And so from that experience, we learned to go in <laughs> and manually create our CloudTrail. Um, and that was a big lesson that we learned. So John, can you tell us some of the limitations of the default logging and why manually creating a trail is important? That's a great question. And you bring up uh, a great example of, you know, working in an enterprise, trying to track down an issue that may have occurred where there was some confusion about what happened, who did it, you know, when did it happen? And that's where CloudTrail really comes in and shines. And as you mentioned, a, a massive best practice, we, we really can't stress it enough, to really configure CloudTrail to log to an S3 bucket with a retention that you're comfortable with. So obviously, the more you log, there'll be some more costs associated, but that's very important data. You're going to have that data around to, to interrogate, to prove what happened, who called the APIs. Um, one of the things we love about AWS, of course, is that it's API driven. And then we want to have a log of what those APIs uh, were doing and, and who called them. So as you mentioned, uh, CloudTrail is a great way to really get that data and, and focus on uh, having it when, when you need it. Yes, so definitely a useful feature to help track down just the trail of who did what and when. And that really brings us to the, not really last chapter because it's an appendix, but it talks about fast fixes. So just several short CLI commands that will help people save time. And I just want to call out quickly my top three. So you gave a CLI command for populating data in a DynamoDB table. That is such a huge time saver. Another fast fix is enabling encryption by default for new EBS volumes in a region. And then I think my favorite, because I've needed to do this, <laughs> create a pre-signed URL for an object in S3 that expires in a week. So can you just maybe, Mike, talk to us about why you decided to add the appendix of fast fixes? Well, this, this is a great um, call out there, especially this top three, I agree. Uh, John and I both found, especially working with so many different folks, so smart in terms of cloud and, 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 and programming, we all keep our libraries of you know one-liners and, and things and snippets and um, with the AWS CLI being so powerful, we, we, we tend to have a, a big amount of those. And so we try to distill down to the useful ones that we use maybe all the time, especially like populating a DynamoDB table very quickly so you can just test, um, make sure things are working okay. That's just a really nice thing to be able to pull really quick and, 
and, and, and, and throw it in. Also, there's some commands in there that John and I use throughout the book to uh, maybe clean up some resources or, or just do some other quick actions. And we built these commands and we wanted to share them because frankly, you know, we, we know there's use cases for, for them. While we might not be covering everything, we thought this is a great starting point. Um, and, you know, maybe in the future, we'll release some new ones on our uh, GitHub organization, uh, github.com slash AWS cookbook, where we're putting some new content uh, uh, frequently there. So these fast fixes, definitely good to have in your tool belt when you're working on the command line with AWS. Definitely. They're very useful. Well, I think that brings our time together to a close, but I just have to say I really enjoyed reading this book. I would love to see this book on the bestsellers list because it has become my go-to source and anyone working on AWS will find this book useful. So thank you so much, Mike and John, for writing this book and for spending time with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thanks for listening to this episode of the GoTo Podcast. Head over to gotopia.tech to discover lots more content from the brightest minds in software development.